the sentence he is in, he will probably have forgotten the sentence before. You ask him a question uh, and he'll give you an answer, but while he's giving you the, the answer, he's already forgotten the question. That's how short it is. What did you do seven seconds ago? Can you remember? Of course you can. It was only seven seconds ago and was likely clicking this video if we're being honest. But in what may seem like a joke can actually happen. Forgetting what happened only mere seconds ago is one of the most terrifying things to ever happen to a human in what has been regarded as the worst case of amnesia in all of human history. For one minute, the patient was living a relatively normal life, with a good career and a loving family. And then all of a sudden, their memory was completely destroyed, not even remembering the names of their own children. Perhaps more terrifying is that this was all due to one viral infection that, if we're being honest, you could catch tomorrow, not even realise. Nevertheless, this case has taught us so much about human memory and how it actually works. So, allow me to share his story. For this is Clive Wary, and he could only remember the previous seven seconds of his life, in the worst case of amnesia of all time. Clive Waring was born on the 11th of May 1938 and is a British former musicologist, pianist, conductor and tenor. As of making this video, he's still alive, residing in care at the age of 85 years old. Before tragedy struck him, Clive lived a rather prestigious life, beginning at just a boy. He was truly gifted in music, learning the piano and vocals at a young age. This helped him progress tremendously in life, for during his adult years, he edited the works of Orlando de Lassus and sang at Westminster Cathedral for many years. Using his success, Clive eventually founded the Europa Singers of London in 1968, an amateur choir which specialised in music of the 17th, 18th and 20th centuries, not the 19th. His choir won critical approval, primarily for the performances of Monteverdi Vespers, giving Waring a bit of fame, and his career continued to skyrocket. Soon Clive was competing in the Concorso Polifonico Internazionale in Arezzo, 1984, and providing choruses for operas staged by the London Opera Centre, whilst also organising the London Lassus Ensemble. Such an already promising future to Clive's career eventually found him working at the BBC, and on the 29th of July 1981, the royal wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer took place, with the BBC giving Clive the job of commandeering Radio 3 in which he captured many recreating meticulously researched scores of the Bavarian royal wedding taking place over 400 years earlier. The BBC were well and truly impressed by the sheer talents of Clive and he remained on the radio for many years. He eventually got married and had two children with his wife before they split shortly after. His career did all but slow though. He continued gaining more and more recognition, love and fame, eventually marrying his second wife, Deborah, in the year 1984. The two were madly in love and they were happy, but this was all to change on the dreaded day of March 27th, 1985. Clive was officially at the height of his career with the BBC, but one day he began feeling unwell. We know now he contracted the herpes simplex virus, which can be spread via contaminated surfaces, skin or fluids. It's the same virus that gives a rise to cold sores around the mouth, in other cases, it causes inflammation of the brain, and most of the time, patients will get the following symptoms. Fever, headaches, altered mentation lasting more than 24 hours, and in the more extreme cases, seizures, focal problems, and neurological deficits. If left untreated, it can be fatal. Prognosis without treatment expects 30% of patients to die. Clive's case was even worse. The virus is often found affecting the central nervous system, but Clive's directly affected his brain and his brain alone. It passed from his dormant ganglia into the brain via travelling along the trigeminal cranial nerve in what is believed to be a very rare process called retrograde axonal transport, seeing the herpes simplex travel along nerves in the opposite direction until it reaches the brain and once it's here it becomes herpes encephalitis. Severe inflammation begins to occur, disrupting brain tissue and brain function. The immune system tries to attack it, but it can't and does more damage to itself. Only when a cyclovir is administered to a patient can the virus be subdued. Clive was given no such medication. It's designed to combat the disease by synthesizing production of a cyclovir triphosphate, 
a very potent inhibitor of viral DNA replication. Without it, the virus was free to replicate at will within Clive's body. This is what made it the worst case we've ever seen in medicine. Uncontrollably, the virus replicated within his temporal lobes, attacking and damaging them entirely. But one region found itself even more afflicted, the hippocampus. This is an organ within the brain responsible in memory, hence the channel name. It allows for short-term memories to become long-term, lasting memories. Retrieval memories that you can think about whenever. He lost this ability. His hippocampi were completely destroyed by the virus, along with some regions of his frontal lobes. No longer could he turn quickly processed information into thoughts and feelings to think about at a later date. His entire brain was stuck in 1985 and the years before it. Whatever were to enter his memory were to vanish completely from it, without a trace, only a mere seven seconds later. I've never seen a human being before, never had a dream or a thought. The brain has been totally inactive, day and night the same, no thoughts at all. Researchers and scientists were fascinated by the case of Clive, though there had never been a case like this, and it's without question that his case has taught us so much. For example, without his hippocampus, it soon became clear that Clive had no transfers into long-term memory. Memories could not be encoded in the hippocampus to be stored in the neocortex, yet the extent of the anterograde amnesia, the loss of memory following the accident, was truly shocking. Clive would wake up every day, every 20 seconds or so, restarting his consciousness once the time span of his short-term memory had elapsed. He would frequently ask anyone he could see on why he has not spoken with a doctor yet. As far as I'm concerned, the doctors have been totally incompetent. I've never seen a doctor. It's been like death. For he has just awoken from a comatose state. He will be able to hold a conversation for around two to three sentences before losing the complete flow and becoming angry when asked about his condition. He was eventually moved to a care home and encouraged to record his thoughts. This is his diary. Around every 30 minutes, there's an entry claiming he is suddenly awake, with the previous entry erased as he is no longer able to remember it. Although he does know it's his handwriting, confusing him even more. But his condition didn't just give him anterograde amnesia, his retrograde amnesia too became quite apparent. This is where the patient cannot remember things before the accident. For example, and most crucially, Clive could no longer remember the names of his children, albeit he knew they existed. I'm going to see your kids tomorrow. You're going to see my kids? Yeah, your children. What are they up to now? Do you know what they're up to no, now? No, no. This taught science that not only was the hippocampus crucial in memory consolidation, it played a huge role in retrieval too. Many of the things he could not remember from the past either, such as his general life accolades and career achievements, whilst also losing his general knowledge or semantic memory. You see, according to Tolving, we have three types of long-term memory. Semantic, episodic, and procedural. Yes, semantic memory is factual information, but episodic memory is one's life experiences that are unique to them. How you felt 20 minutes ago is episodic, but knowing the capital of France is Paris is semantic. Clive lacked both, and scientists were highly intrigued. Another ancient question had been answered and that it was now clear that both semantic and episodic memory were associated with the hippocampus, and these were actually stored in its local formation. But what about the third one, procedural memory? Whilst it was initially thought to be similar, scientists were soon to be surprised. Procedural memory refers to learned actions, learning to ride a bike, driving a car, or swimming. Even though it may not seem it, it's stored in your brain. With Clive, one thing would test if he had his procedural memory intact. Could he still play the piano? To the shock of researchers, he could. His playing was near perfect, not missing a single note. Because of Clive, we managed to localise procedural memory to the cerebellum at the back of the brain. His was never damaged by the virus, which explains this. Scientists tested this further. Clive could in fact acquire new procedural memories through repetition. If he were to watch a certain video recording multiple times on successive days, he could anticipate certain parts of the content without remembering how he actually learned it. Thanks to Clive's case, scientists not only concluded the role of the hippocampus in memory, but the different storage of declarative and procedural memory. So, what actually became of Clive? Well, in 1994, Clive and his wife Deborah unfortunately separated due to the illness causing significant stress to Deborah's life, which is understandable. She spent a while touring America, before returning to England to spend time with her ex-husband who she deeply missed, eventually remarrying in 2002. They are both still alive, with Deborah writing books discussing in detail Clive's case. Whenever Clive sees her, he thinks it's his first meeting with her in years, 
even if it's only been a few seconds. Oh, look who's come! Oh, 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 <laughs> They're now madly in love, with Clive delighted by her presence whenever she visits, and even when he forgets she's there. Scientists gradually stop their research of Clive as to not cause him more distress. Currently remains happy within his care home, never understanding just how much he's actually helped the field of psychology. We owe him a lot. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate every single one of you. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It's free and it really helps me out. See you next time.